60 Great Ghost Stories, read by H. Washington Sawyer. Tonight's story, Footsteps in the Snow, by Mario Sadotti. It was the last straw that broke the camel's back. Just before lunchtime, he had come back to the hotel and gone up to his room. His wife was in the bathroom, combing her hair. She had not locked herself in as she usually did, and so he thought it was all right to go in. But she shouted at him with hate. Yes, real hate in her voice. Do you mind closing the door, please? He closed the door, went out of the room, left the hotel. It was still snowing. While he lunched in the old restaurant with all its gilt decoration, mirrors, and stained glass, he gazed out at the snow falling against the dark russet background of the Palazzo Carignano, the snow lying on the Baroque cornices, the window moldings, the pattern of oblique lines and ornaments, repeated, retraced inevitably and precisely the light strokes of Guarini's pen when, in his first rapid sketches, he pictured the facade of the palace. Similarly, Gioberti, in the center of the square, was limbed in snow only on the shoulders and arms and the folds of his frock coat around his head. It seemed no longer a monument, but an impression of a monument dashed off by a depisis with a few brush strokes of white paint. It appeared beautiful even though it wasn't. The snow simplified everything like a great designer. He thought of his father, who, whenever he quarreled with his mother, lunched out, always or nearly always, at the same restaurant where he was now for like reasons, and which in his father's time looked exactly the same in every detail as it was today and had been 130 years before. 130 plus 40, 170. He thought of his father's life, and then he thought of his own. So different, and yet, in a way, so similar. Wasn't there a woman in existence then, with whom life might at least be tolerable? One after another, he thought of all the women who had preceded his wife. He tried to be objective. One after another, he dismissed them. They were no better than his wife. They were just the same. The only difference, the slight preference that he was tempted to allow the others, lay merely in the fact that he had not married them whereas he had married her. If he had married any one of the others, she would have immediately become quite as tiresome. He was sure of it. He might as well have saved time and stopped at the first, he told himself, heaving a deep sigh. But who was the first? Who was the very first he had been with, when this absurd and inevitable idea of marriage flashed through his mind. It was a long reverie, long, slow, uncertain, delving back into the distant, forgotten past, back to his adolescent days. And meanwhile his eyes, almost independently, and as if indulging in some pleasant, lethargic, and silly optic exercise, stared fascinated at the snow, which was falling gently and steadily against the dark black drop of the Piazza Carignano. The dense flakes, however, following ever-changing courses and taking ever-changing shapes, great fleeting arabesques forming and disintegrating before the eye could catch them. A long reverie. It was impossible to remember them all. Too many years had passed. But the first. Who was the first? The first, without any doubt, had been Lina. A little bit older than him, perhaps, blonde, tall, strong, but at the same time rosy, soft-skinned, vital, open-minded, intelligent, and most tender. A Turin girl, too, a bank clerk. They had carried on a flirtation, our country folk would say, 
they had spoken to each other all spring, from March to June or July, no longer. Everything was fine. He had been happy, happier than with any of the other women later on in life. If only he had known, if only he had even suspected, but Lena had been sudden, complete, gratuitous happiness. Why couldn't this boon be repeated at least once more? He had his whole life before him, and so he had left her. It had been he. There was no doubt about this either. He, and not she, had been the one to break it off. But why? For nothing at all. Just like that. Summer was coming. Holidays were in the air. A good excuse. He, middle class, she, on the other hand, a working girl. But that was not why he had broken it off. He had broken it off simply because he was 20. Still without a degree and no job in sight. How could he possibly think seriously of marriage? Yet, he had thought of it. When one night in a park in an old villa, then a few kilometers outside the city, today overtaken by a suburb, embracing Lina, he had felt a completely different sensation from what he experienced with all the others. Anyway, until then they had been few. Sitting on the grass, amid the scent of a great magnolia in almost total darkness, he could still see her red lips, her strong, gleaming white teeth, and above all, her big blue eyes. She was the first real woman in his life, a being so similar to himself, and yet so profoundly different. The creature he was holding close, melting into one with her, obeying in a natural yet mysterious way the finest and highest instinct. Due to the simple fact that he was no longer embracing himself, but another person, he seemed to be embracing the infinite. In the grounds of the old villa, that May night, he clasped the infinite tightly to him, beneath his lips, in his hands. Then why let it slip away? Why not live together always till death did them part? Why not marry Lina? He'd thought about it. Yes, he had thought about it, but at once, or almost at once, he had dismissed the idea as sheer folly. Now, thirty years later, he knew that it might have been the wise thing to do, or at least an act of folly no greater than the one that he eventually committed. It would really have been just as well. With all these reflections, it was getting late. After lunch, he had sat motionless, looking out at the snow. For how long? He was roused by the timid voice of a waiter presenting the bill. The great glittering gold dining room was completely empty. There, at the other end, he recognized two gentlemen in overcoats and hats as the owner and the senior waiter. They were obviously waiting for him to go before leaving themselves. He looked at the time. It was almost five o'clock. So that was why the facade of the Palazzo Catagnano was no longer reddish, but black. Night was near. He paid up and went out. He strolled aimlessly along under the arcades, and when he felt tired, he would turn into a cafe and that was it. But he would go back to the hotel and see his wife again. No, not yet. He strolled under the arcades, desperate yet happy at the same time. Outside, it was still snowing. He remembered reading in a touring club guide that Turin has 14 kilometers of arcades. What other town in the world can offer such a civilized amenity? Bologna? Maybe. Padua? But they are not tall, airy, and modern like these. And so he walked on and on, and it had been dark for some time when he finally found himself at the corner of Corso Vinzalio and Corso Vittorio, which from his childhood days had always seemed to him the boundary of 19th-century bourgeois Turin. 
that corner, to be exact, where the arcades of the two main streets meet after a journey of 14 kilometers across the city and up the gentle slope on which it is built from the banks of the Po. Beyond the corner was the last stretch of Corso Vittorio, dreary for lack of arcades. Here were the prison, Borgo San Paolo, workers, factories, and cruel future. He smiled at that old idea. The future is always cruel. It is by nature. Now, after so many years, he no longer felt that gulf between the bourgeois and the working-class city, the 19th and 20th century. That old corner of Corso Vinzalio and Corso Vittorio, stretching like a jetty out into the sea, the night and the future was no longer a jetty, no longer the farthest limit. The sea, facing him, had become dry land. The future had become the present, and bourgeois Turin willingly accepted the embraces of working-class Turin, her glory, riches, and defense. But for anyone, bourgeois or working-class, on a snowy winter's night like that, strolling aimlessly along the arcades, trying to ease some private grief. The corner of Corso Vinzalio and Corso Vittorio were still the natural spot to pause. How often during the one far-off spring of their love had he stopped right there at night with Lina before returning Rebrouchier Chemin? Just at the corner he saw that a taxi was parked in a rank by the pavement. Should he go back to the hotel and face that bitch? He felt a tightening around his heart. But what was he to do then? During the long walk through the arcades, in the confusion of memories and daydreams that seemed to fall and flow, dancing and intertwining like snowflakes, a favorite image returned persistently, a sweet, lovely, consoling image. The park at the old villa, that night in May, Lina's face beneath his kisses. Taxi, he called with sudden resolve. And climbing in, he told the driver the name of what so many years before had been a village separated from the city and was now a small suburb. When he arrived, it had stopped snowing. He left the taxi in the square of the village, still unchanged with its low houses and their large doorways and thick buttressed walls, old country houses and farm cottages huddling together. But already, beyond the snow-laden roofs, no more than 200 meters in the direction of Turin, there were to be seen towering, geometrical, checkered, by a thousand lighted windows and balconies, the first joint owner buildings, houses under mortgage, workers and clerks, ugly blocks of flats. There was a cafe still open. He offered the driver a drink and asked him to wait there. He would not be long. The villa was only a few steps away, 200 meters, just off the square, he remembered. The gate suddenly appeared in a lane of the old village. From there on, the lane became a country road sloping down to the nearby river Dora, and flanked on one side for some distance by the boundary wall of the villa. He recalled a holy water stoop a few meters past the gate, a holy water stoop or votive shrine almost against the wall, and a gap in the wall blocked by a large thicket and hidden in the case by the shrine. The park was very big. The villa, 18th century and usually unoccupied, except in autumn for the holiday season. Perhaps today everything had changed. Perhaps the gap was no longer there. So many years. No matter, if nothing else, he had to see that old wall again, which, at least so it seemed today, had embraced the nearest moment of truth in his whole life. To truth or to happiness, both. 
He confused the two. Naturally, it was not so easy. Simply crossing the square and following the lane as far as the gate, it was quite a little undertaking. He sank up to his calves in soft, fresh snow, as he was not wearing suitable shoes. The lane was deserted and dim, old lamps with enameled shades, widely spaced out at the corners of the houses, shone like gems in the cold, pure night air. If it had not been for the music, songs, laughter, bawling and applause coming from the television sets in the houses as he passed by, he might have been walking through a forsaken village. The voices and sounds, either because of the thickness of the walls or the deep snow that covered everything, were strangely muffled as if swathed in cotton wool. Soon they died away. All he could hear was his own heavy breathing and the light crunch of each step as he planted his foot in the snow, followed by a sputter as it dropped about when he raised his foot again. There was the gate. Behind him lay the village and the city, facing just the villa and the open countryside. If he paused a moment and held his breath, he could sense it from the silence. And in that silence, now almost absolute, as soon as he set off again, the sound of his footsteps in the snow seemed deafening. The shrine was there, old, peeling, dilapidated. Now it seemed unlikely that they would have bothered to repair the gap. But suppose they had. He struggled up the bank, up over the snow, and the snow, sliding away in lumps, carried him down again. By putting on his gloves and grasping a crumbling cornice which separated the base of the shrine from the actual niche containing the figure of the Madonna, or a saint, he finally made it. There was a grating, but no light burning inside he couldn't see or remember. The snow had covered in a single mass both thicket and wall. To discover a gap, you had to know of its existence. No, it had not been repaired, and all that snow, by covering it, made it easier to get across. When he reached an avenue in the park, he stopped, his heart pounding, once more listened to the silence, but now for a long, long time, as if in depth. The air was still, clear, and chilly. Nearby, the only sounds were the occasional cracking of boughs as they broke beneath the weight of fresh snow and the muffled thuds that followed. And, Lord knows why, the thuds and cracks had a kind of live, tortured quality. Far away, the whistle of a train, shunting maybe in the station of Abagnano, the rumble of a lorry over towards Peonezza on the road on the other side of the Dora. As he stood motionless in the middle of the avenue, listening to all these sounds, far and near, his eyes gradually became accustomed to the gloom, or maybe it was the snow itself shedding light, apart from some black mysterious shadows under the thickest clumps of evergreens, pines, cedars, magnolias, holm oaks. Everything seemed to him as bright as day, but without the colors. He began to move forward, slowly. Here and there among the trees he could make out flower beds, great circles and ovals where the snow was convex in shape and appeared to be deeper. He noticed at regular intervals along both sides of the avenue oblong mounds from the top of which emerged the curved backs of iron park benches, then a frozen fountain, a stone bust. And above all, he noticed a way to the right through the delicate clear tracery of naked trees in a space left by the evergreens, the great gray front of the villa. He was not so far away now. Another hundred meters and he would be there, there among the flower beds, the hedges and the trees, in that open space in front of the villa, in the parterre at whose edge, beneath the great magnolia, he thought he embraced the infinite, Lina. 
he gazed at the façade of the villa and began to make out the outlines of the windows, the little rococo portico, the iron balconies. He suddenly stopped, terrified by a natural enough thought, but which until then, maybe because of the magic of memories or the spell of time and place, had not crossed his mind. What if there was someone at the villa? He knew that during the war, and for a long time after the war, it had been lived in, or at any rate occupied, by a number of evacuee families all year round, winter included. They heated the great rooms with stoves, cooked in the fireplaces. In short, they made the best of it. Now suppose just one of those families was still there. Or what if there was a caretaker, a gardener? In that case, though, there would be very probably a dog. And by now, after more than five minutes since he had climbed over the wall and walked through the park, the dog would have barked, or at least growled behind a door, if they had shut it in. But though he strained his ears, he could hear nothing. True. He remembered hearing about some particularly intelligent and ferocious watchdogs, which, without stirring, allow the thief or intruder to enter the grounds they guard. They let him almost reach the house, and then they take him by surprise and leap at his legs or throat. Afraid? Was he afraid? By natural association of ideas, he remembered his wife. What was there fiercer to fear? And smiling to himself, he walked on. He reached the villa. Ten meters farther, he stood in the center of the wide, empty space in front of the house. Here, the brightness of the snow was still more intense. He looked up at the sky, as if looking for the moon and stars. It was overcast, uniform, high, gray cloud, but with a touch of white, surely a reflection from the snow. Where was the big magnolia tree? It was there, there on the left, enormous, solid, veneered in white and black, its lowest branches snow-laden, bent down to within a meter of the ground. Beneath you could glimpse a sort of vast, deep, pitch-dark cavern. It was there in that cavern that he had brushed true happiness for the first and last time in his life. As he looked at the cavern, all at once with a start, he seemed to remember a certain sentence that Lena had said to him, and on hearing it, he had felt a sudden urge to weep, shout, go berserk. To run away with Lena to America or Australia, just the two of them, married and ready to make a fresh start, far from all that had been their reality till then. The effect had been so strong that immediately afterwards he had felt afraid. He had tried to forget that sentence. Soon, after a few weeks, he had tried to forget Lena, too. And he had succeeded, but only for thirty years. Now Lena was there, alive, there with him. And the sentence? The sentence? He closed his eyes in an attempt to remember, to remember it exactly, word for word. He closed his eyes clasped his hands over them, and half turned with his back to the magnolia. This, too, was to help him think, to avoid the temptation of looking at the magnolia until he remembered the exact expression. For the magnolia which fascinated him, white, black, oppressive, mysterious, would distract him. Well, Lina, at a certain moment, slipped from his embrace had looked straight at him with her laughing blue eyes, spoken his name, and softly whispered, almost breathed in his face, What would your mother say if she saw you here? That was it. He was sure. In his whole life he could remember nothing more beautiful. He heard the sound of a light footstep in the snow then more steps that came up behind him. He shivered. It was terror 
yet at the same time something akin to pleasure. He felt that he must turn around, but he didn't have the courage. Maybe by turning around he would see. Oh, it was worth the effort, no doubt. But fear was stronger. Now the step stopped, terribly near, perhaps less than a meter behind him. He seemed to feel an icy cold breath on the nape of his neck. The wind? He felt his eyes suddenly filling with tears. Have pity. Forgive me. He wanted to cry out. Not pity or forgiveness because he believed even at that crucial moment that he had wronged Lena by leaving her, but pity and forgiveness for no particular reason, simply because he was afraid. And Lena? Where was Lena now? He had never heard of her since. That was that, and there was no reason to think that. A rustling, a quick gossamer light thread, then a creaking, a crack, a thud. As if the person who had approached him in the snow had stopped behind him, almost near enough to touch him, had abruptly turned and run away. Or maybe it was merely his imagination. The only real sounds were the crack and the final thud. Another branch, like so many breaking beneath the weight of the snow. Perhaps a magnolia branch this time. That was just the direction from which the sound had come. He turned to see. He turned and saw in the snow, in a direct line between him and the magnolia, the fresh, clear prints of two small feet, a woman's, footprints that came up to him from the magnolia and then went back to the tree. His first impulse, of course, was to run to the magnolia, but he couldn't. He felt that his legs wouldn't support him. The second impulse was to shout. Meanwhile, a snowflake fell, then another. A moment, and it had started to snow again. As soon as he felt strong enough, he called. Who is it? Who's there? But his voice died away, echoless, in the air blanketed by the snow, which was now falling heavily. Why did he lack the courage to follow those little footprints up to the magnolia? In a few minutes the snow would obliterate them, and he would never know. He would lose together with the proof that it was not a hallucination, that the footprints were real, the last opportunity of knowing. But perhaps that was exactly his intention. He didn't want to know. He was afraid of knowing. At a run, sinking deep in the snow, stumbling, falling, plunging on somehow, he crossed the deserted park to the gap in the wall. He clambered over it and did not stop until he reached the village square and saw the small, distant, green shape of his taxi bathed in a yellow light outside the cafe where he had left it.